Hi everyone, welcome. Let's uh, get into today's webinar. We've got a fantastic one ahead of us. A couple of speakers who will join us um, very, very shortly. Actually, you guys want to pop your cameras on and, and unmute yourselves. We can we can start getting stuck into it, and I can get into the introduction. So today we've got a a great webinar. PPSR webinars are always extremely well received. Um, always some of our most well registered for and attended webinars as well. This case is no different. We have about 600 um, registrations already in place. Plenty of people coming online still. I can see the numbers ticking over, which is great, but we won't delay it too long. Um, we want to get into it. We've got plenty to get through. So thank you for joining today. So here's the agenda for today. The Australian economy, our current context, what is PPSR? So there's going to be a bit of background on that, obviously. So, um, you know, stay tuned, stay with us. If it's if it's a little bit basic for you, we know that out there in, in the commercial land, amongst our members, amongst Australian businesses, there's organisations and, and individuals that are almost experts on this. And then there's plenty at the other end of the spectrum who, who actually know absolutely nothing about PPSR or very little. So we want to make sure we serve um, everyone from you know top to bottom as best we can. Who and what can be registered? Tips for your business, and of course questions. I do encourage you to ask questions along the way. Um, you know we've got the opportunity for some for some Q and A. Hopefully, depending on how long um, we go for, because we've got plenty to get through. Our speakers today, Gavin Mikoska from AFSA. Um, in terms of you know heavy hitters and the best people to talk about. PPSR, Gavin is certainly um, the man or the person, I should say, that we want in charge and joining us today. So Gavin, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on board. Gavin is AFSA's Deputy Chief Executive. As you can see here, he's got a huge amount of experience, but in particular, you see there in October 2014, he was appointed as the PPS Registrar was responsible for the operations of the PPS regime um, and was senior, ex uh, senior executive responsible for defining the approach to the development of organisational strategy. He is um, certainly got a fantastic grip on what's going on with PPSR and also with AFSA in general. So we're going to get some fantastic insights from him. So thank you, Gavin and Natalie, that plenty of people would know. Natalie, great to have you on board as well. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Good to be here. Um, Natalie, um, obviously from Ledland Lawyers, huge amount of knowledge around law in general, but particularly commercial law and of course PPSR. We love your insights. We love having you on board. You, I don't want to, well, I'm going to say you, you, you dumb it down for people like me who need it dumbed down. So I appreciate that. You make it Learning. really easy. <laughs> you make it really easy to understand. Um, regardless of whether, you know, you're, you're, you're new to business, new to the PPS. A, or you've got a total, you know, um, total background in it. So um, Natalie is an absolute gun um, and we've had her on board for plenty of sessions in the past, particularly with PPSR. Um, so Natalie, thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm obviously not gonna go through all the bios about Gavin and Natalie. I'm really impressed and, and, and to be honest, um, a little bit intimidated by them. Yeah, we've got some absolute guns joining us today. So thank you for that. So Gavin, I am going to pass over to you to take it away. There'll be some toing and froing today. Everyone who's joined a webinar before knows that I um, I like to go backwards and forwards and, and, and that's what we'll see today. And I'll throw some questions in there. And actually, sorry, Gavin, the one thing I did forget before I kick off, um, I'll control the, the slides today. So if I'm a little bit slow, just um, just yell at me to, to be quicker and when you want your, your next slide up, of course helps with continuity and a quick poll, love a poll, before we do get started so that we've got a really good understanding of who is online today and um, who's using PPSR. So do you currently register on the PPSR? Yes or no? If you could get your votes in really quickly, we'll then get on with it because I know Gavin's chomping at the bit to get started and I'll share those results um, as well. All right, 80% have voted. That'll do, that's a really nice sample size there. 
53% yes, 47% no. So 50-50 there, Gavin, for you and for Natalie to understand who you're dealing with, which is good. Probably doesn't help at all. You probably hope, you know, that a big set is a yes or a big set is a no, but 50-50, it's nice. I like it. Gavin, over to you. No, thanks, Patrick. Thanks very much for the invitation to uh, speak with everybody today. It's um, it's certainly a privilege to be here and um, you know, I'm you know, glad Natalie's here because any complex questions that can come, we can certainly throw to the gun that is Natalie, as you as you mentioned. I'm um, ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so look, yeah, thank you. I think you know, it, it's actually, you know, we find in AFSA, so we're the Australian Financial Security Authority, we, we find ourselves in quite a unique position um, in the current economic climate in that we look after not only the, the PPSR, but also the bankruptcy system, the personal insolvency system for the country. And so I'll, I'll be touching on a little bit of, um, of data that's relevant you know, to highlight the importance of the PPSR. So for those 47% of you out there who aren't currently registering, I think that we can certainly highlight some of the, uh, the reasons why. And for the 53% that are already registering, I think it will uh, certainly uh, validate the need to continue to do so through some of the things we'll, we'll have to say today. Um, but certainly the uh, the economic conditions are a you know very interesting um, situation that we find ourselves in. When you look at the business sentiments that came through in the earlier stages of COVID last year, it was you know certainly a dire situation that people were forecasting to occur. All the commentators were talking about uh, about such. But in terms of the uh, the more recent um, information, no doubt you're all you know basically obviously experiencing the economy yourselves, but you know also working within that in the way that you're managing credit within your, um, I presume we have a range of credit managers and, and the like on the, on the line through the, the conversation today as well. So the business confidence confidence through, you know, there's a few different sort of surveys and out, the, out there, for example, what we've just referred to the, the monthly business survey by the NAB um, here, it clearly shows that, you know, the conditions rose to record highs in April. Um, yeah, with all the strengths and conditions across all of the states and industries, which is very interesting, you know, to, to see that that is a, a uniform elevation of business confidence out there. I think, you know, through the data that Patrick has obviously on, on payment times and that, there's still some, <clears throat> you know, some way to go before you might actually see that come through in all the data, but you'll probably be touching on that uh, a bit later um, as well, as well, Patrick. So I think it's a good signs to see that we're continuing to grow. There might be some sort of simmering uncertainties that still remain. You hear about some supply chain finance challenges and like there as well, but um, you know, certainly you know, the, the early data post JobKeeper is also seeing um, some positive signs as well with employment stats and things like that come out recently. So, so hopefully we'll uh, yeah, continue on that pathway for the economy in Australia. Um, so yeah, so where, where does that lead us to? So it's obviously we, we are, seeing um, you know the the bankruptcy data you might have noticed again through your work has remained quite subdued um, you know throughout COVID so since the beginning of COVID since the beginning of JobKeeper um, and the additional job seeker allowances in particular we believe are a lot of the cause as well as people tightening their belts to increase savings talking to a range of the banks and there's been a number of stories about that out there that people are increasing savings buffers um, you know, so not only, you know, the increased sort of expenditure that can occur as a result of JobKeeper, et cetera, there, the, 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 the amount of buffers that people are, have been retaining has been increasing as well. So what that means for the future of the, the numbers you know, over the next, you know, period of time is a little uncertain to see where it might normalise back to. But interestingly, when you look historically, um, and the data has remained relatively similar throughout the COVID period just proportionally, 38% of everybody that does enter into personal bankruptcy is due to a business related reason. So, um, you know, that's a, we have obviously a lot of sole traders and, um, and other, uh, you know, unincorporated businesses throughout the economy. They make up, in fact, about 62% um, of businesses in the economy. And we see a bunch of those fall into the system here. But also, just you might note that individuals who are directors of companies, may also have given up a personal or a director's guarantee and therefore may actually fall into the personal insolvency system by virtue of those types of things as well. But the data shows us and it's relatively um, you know, consistent over you know, many years since at least 2007 when we had a change to our data um, revision process there, around 38% of people who enter into um, bankruptcies are business related. 
Um, and 70% of those are, as it shows on the slide here, actually sole traders or partner in, in partnership as well. So it's very interesting times when you then look at what that means for you know the PPSR and how that might be utilised um, into the future. So we might move and on. I might, I might, I might jump in just to give Credit Watch a little plug, which I rarely do on these, but um, this this also leads to showing the importance of monitoring those entities, right? So if you are monitoring a commercial entity, whether it's a company or a sole trader or a partnership, you're getting those email alerts that they're either failing or have failed, um, which is a nice precursor. You obviously want to get ahead of that. Yeah, and that's one of the key things I think in the, um, you know, what does remain as relatively uncertain economic environment when you're dealing on the transaction every day and deciding whether you're going to extend some trade credit or, or otherwise really understanding what the exposure is, who you're dealing with is, you know, I think more important than ever um, right now. And so, you know, using the, you know, the data that comes through the bankruptcy register search, you know, which is used in, you know, products that obviously is offered by credit um, information services like is offered by Creditor Watch is a really useful thing, as well as also searching the PPSR to understand what the um, what assets are encumbered through certain um, uh, you know, offerings as well. Great, thanks, Kevin. So, in terms of um, what the PPSR is, so it is the online register of security interests in personal property. Now, the whole term and the you know I think the the the, the title of the webinar was was unpacking the acronym or something of that nature. I'd actually prefer to keep the acronym well and truly packed together because it becomes quite confusing unless you are a lawyer um, to actually know what personal property is. Um, and that's one thing which, you know, I think Natalie might, you know, just do you want to jump in and just actually explain what personal property is, Natalie? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gavin. Um, I think in terms of the PPSA, we actually have to make the distinction between real property, so real property is, is land essentially and anything that is affixed to the land. So if you've got a house um, sitting on a piece of land, that's your real property. Personal property is generally speaking anything else. So um, goods, cars, trucks, um, you know, machinery, um, computers, pretty much anything. If you have a look around your office or your room right now, most of the things that you can see there are going to be considered to be um, personal property. And there are also some intangible things as well, like shares, um, cash in a bank account, that sort of thing as well. Great, thanks. Now, I thought it'd be uh, best to hear it from an authoritative source in the private sector rather than the government often telling you what the, what the difference is. <laughs> But uh, look, you know, that, and that's why it's important. It's it's everything you know that isn't real estate, basically land or real estate. And so, therefore, I think you know the single registry to be able to actually identify where there is a security interest over all things that your business might be dealing with, um, you know, so is 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 a really useful tool, you know, for the economy and to be able to make a registration when you are extending credit to have clear priority rights. Um, you know, clearly defined through that registration process so that when there might be an insolvent event, we just, you know, heard that around 38% of people that enter into the individual bankruptcy system, let alone the corporate insolvency system, um, you know, is business related. So, you know, and when, you're, when you're dealing with that, you really need to think about, well, how can I get put myself in the best possible position? The PPSR is the mechanism by which you become a secured creditor. Um, and so by registering on the PPSA, you have clear priority rights. It will clearly show you if you're first in line to be paid in the event of default or insolvency. Um, you know, and, and you can actually you know, have the opportunity to, to go and repossess, obviously, the particular uh, assets which the registration has been made over. And obviously, sell those to get as much money back as we can. In, in terms of the usage, it's a really significantly used register. You can see the data. Uh, the data on the, on the slide there, there's been 22 million registrations since it was launched in um, January 2012. <clears throat> there's around 10 million current, currently active registrations. So that means there's been a lot that's been discharged as well. That's an indicator that I look at to make sure that for you guys out there who are using this every day, there's, a, there's not a lot of clutter on the register. There's actually you know, all active registrations. It isn't that there's registrations that are sitting there and people aren't discharging. They are actually actively just managing, amending them to make sure that they've got the up-to-date email addresses and stuff like that, seeing as an important tool. 10 million searches every year of this register um, and about two to two and a half million registrations every year. So it's a really well-used registry and it's really important for the economy. So thanks, Patrick.
on mute. Um, so I guess you know this next one is is really asking, and this is this this is you know for Gavin, it's for it's for Natalie. You know who do, who does this apply to? Is the big question, and and Gavin, you sort of nailed it before when you said you know the the, the people who are listening in the attendees today you know obviously credit manager heavy but then you'll have finance and then you'll also have small business owners and managers as well so you know I think with, with that in mind you know who does this apply to and and the questions really here are answering themselves aren't they yeah I'll just jump in quickly I'd, I'd say everybody like one of the, one of the other important things to know about the PPSR is that's not actually just for business um, finance and the like there it's actually for personal or consumer finance as well. So when you go and um, you know buy a car on finance, it'll be registered on the PPSR. Um, you know, the, when, when there's any personal lending, you know that uh, you know, the, the the financier can consider also registering on the on the PPSR. So it's a single conclusive registry and list of the exposure that an individual has or that an entity has, um, you know, to any anything that's not real estate. So that's um, I'd say it's really applicable to everybody. Nat, do you agree? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Gavin. Um, one of the questions that I often get asked is, well, should I be registering? And I think if you can see yourself or your business in any of these examples here, I think you definitely need to be um, looking at your processes and, and trying to get on the register. And there is one there that I just wanted to touch on, uh, that final point. Um, do you have um, guarantors with, with charging clauses in your favour? Something that we often recommend to our clients is, if you have a guarantee um, for the director of a company, for example, to personally guarantee a debt, consider putting some PPSA clauses into that guarantee to give you some extra security over personal property owned by an individual, so that individual guarantor. So often you'll see um, a, a guarantee with a, a charging clause over the real property, so the land that that person owns, but there are lots of people out there who have um, great collections of you know, luxury cars and watches and even cryptocurrency these days. Um, so if you can be putting some some clauses into your personal guarantees to take some security over um, those personal assets of, of your guarantors, that's also a way to to get that registration on and protect yourself to a to a deeper level. Fantastic. Thank you. So Natalie, over to you. Thanks, Pat. Um, well, so I know um, unpacking the acronym, that's our, our webinar um, topic for the day. So I wanted to bring with me just a little visual tool to help us with that. So I have here just a copy of the, of the PPSA um, because often I get asked, what's the difference between the PPSA and the PPSR? Often clients will use those two terms interchangeably. So I wanted to try and really um, have people understand what that difference is. So this, this scary looking book here filled with um, lots of fine print, which is generally the stuff of nightmares for most people, um, is, is the PPSA. So that's the ACT. So when you're using that, that acronym PPSA, think about ACT. It's the legislation. It's, it's what's creating these rights and obligations um, that you're going to use to then register. So then when we talk about PPSR, as Gavin has explained, that is essentially like the online notice board. So that's where you're really telling the world about your interest in um, that particular piece of, of personal property. Um, the way that I often explain it to clients is if you think about it similarly to taking out a mortgage, so you're going to the bank, um, the bank's going to lend you money and you're going to use that money to purchase a property. They're going to put a mortgage over, over your property and when you do a title search, you're going to be able to see that that mortgage is on there. You're going to see there's an interest in that land and um, the bank is going to have security in that in that asset. So the, the PPSR is, is similar. It's not quite the same, a similar kind of concept um, as that. So that's how I sometimes explain it to clients to, to get them to understand the difference um, between that. Um, and I think we've, we've got an explanation there on the slides of personal property, which we have um, sort of already been through, but um, yeah, basically anything that you can pick up. I mean, even this this act is, is probably a piece of personal property there. Um, so yeah, anything you can really get your hands on is, is going to be considered personal property. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so 
One thing I think is probably really important just out of that um, explanation that is to really highlight that unlike a land titles registry where that is obviously showing the ownership of the land and has the supplementary addition of the, the mortgage um, written into it, the PPSR is actually the exact opposite of that and um, backed by the PPSA. It's, it's the register of the security interest, not of the ownership. And so it doesn't actually convey any ownership rights at all um, to the underlying asset against which you are registering your security interest. That's probably just an important distinction just to, just to make sure it's clear um, for everybody as well. But what can be registered, I think, you know, through the, the definition of personal property that Natalie provided us earlier and some of the additional comments that we've made, hopefully it's becoming clear that you can basically use anything um, as collateral. It's whatever you would see value between, um, you know, in, in dealing with uh, with somebody that you're dealing with. So the whole, one of the underlying premises and the, largely a future-proofed um, piece of legislation is what the PPSR is because if two parties agree that there's value in something or other, um, you can use that as an asset to register it against on the on the PPSR. There are a very, very small list of exclusions um, written into the Act, but they you know, are not relevant to most daily transactions in the economy. Um, so it really is, as you see, if you've got a water bottle, water bottle there and you want to go and borrow 10 bucks from Patrick, you, know, you can offer that up and uh, and see if he'll give it to you and register the security interest and, um, you know, and, and come back and get back if you don't pay him back, you know, for example. Picking up on though, the other points that were on the, um, I think on the earlier slides, yeah, leases, leases are also, uh, you know, under certain definitions applicable to be, to be registered. Um, so there's certain aspects which are called functional equivalents to a, um, a security interest, and the purpose of including a range of those things into the um, the Act and the registry is that it can provide a single view of the exposure. Um, that a, an individual or an entity has uh, to all of these various obligations, even though they might not be under strict legal terms, a security interest. But um, yeah, there's a few things on the slide there, but you basically can register um, anything, but it's not about ownership. Fantastic, thank you. So I'll start with, sorry, did you want to jump in there? Sorry, mate, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, how, how the how, how the PBSR can help your business and, and I think you know we've, earlier we probably said oh you know Natalie you can take this slide and to be honest Gavin you could jump in with this slide I, I, I'm happy for you guys to sort of fight over how you want to uh, answer this this question that comes up here. I think this might be one of the slides Gavin so I'm happy for you to, to take this one if you like. Look I'll just you know, to throw a couple in and you, uh, hand over to, to you guys to, to, to supplement for sure. Um, but I guess, you know, we, we've touched on already, it's a really important tool to be able to help, you know, protect you from, um, you know, customer default or insolvency or put you put you in the best possible position, I suppose, is the, is the better way of describing that um, in the event that your um, customer, you know, goes insolvent or, or defaults. It puts you outside really of the, the liquidation regime and those types of things by being a secured creditor, assuming you've got an effective and appropriate contract underlying the security interest, which you need to go and talk to Natalie about. And then you've got actually an effective security interest registered on the PPSR. You don't, you actually go ahead of any of the costs of the liquidator or the employee entitlements, all that sort of stuff, because it sits outside um, as a secured creditor, the, the, um, the insolvency regime effect for that in terms it of really simplifies, it really simplifies it for that for that creditor you know an insolvency event is a real or a liquidation event is a really complex um, process to go through if you can have a simple registration over your, your, your goods for example it is a much 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 nicer way of dealing with a uh, an insolvency event Exactly. So um, the the other benefits are, as I've mentioned already, knowing who you're dealing with, having that single registry to be able to understand what all of the obligations are that you um, would come up against, that uh, that you may gain priority against. You know, in terms of being able to get before you register, you can search the registry so you can go, okay, I can get first priority if I register over this asset or you can understand if you would have to take second priority um, and the like there. So actually searching the register as a part of your due diligence before you, you know, sign up a new 
um, trade credit line or something like that is something that you might want to um, think about as well. Um, and then finally, you've just from uh, this one, assisting to access finance. So if you are if you are in business, and um, I've got a, a, a friend who's in real estate, um, and he had a rent roll. Um, you know, obviously you're, you're renting out a range of properties, uh, managing a range of properties, renting out for for others there, and the like. He was trying to you know do a small development and was struggling to get the finance. And I said to him, Have you tried to offer up your rent roll um, to your bank to be able to use uh, as collateral? And he said, no, I hadn't. I didn't realise I could do that. He went away and did that, and they ended up getting the finance to be able to go and actually uh, uh, you know, fund that development fee. So you can use basically anything here, being innovative in what the assets are that you already have, and how you might be able to use us, use those to gain access to capital is also a, another angle that businesses can consider. Natalie, did you want to add anything? Or happy for me to jump jump forward? Look, I guess maybe um, just on the flip side, knowing the registrations that you might have against your business as well. Um, so I'm not sure how many people have actually done a PPS search on themselves, but um, it could also be a risk management um, tool for you to do with your business to know really what's out there um, and yet yeah, use that to, to make sure that you're aware of the situation that your business might be in. Yep, very good point. So this is this is a really good way to start thinking about how it works from a practical sense, right? Is that the best way to sort of look at it? Yeah, definitely. So I guess we've talked about um, the register itself and why it's really important for your business to be getting on the register. Um, but there are a few key things that you're going to need to be able to actually do that. Um, so the first thing that you're going to need, as Gavin mentioned before, is a contract with your customer um, and the the technical term for that is your security agreement. So for most of the people out there listening to the webinar, that's going to be um, your terms and conditions generally. Um, and that is the document in which um, you'll create your security interest. Um, and so then the second thing following on from that you're going to need is that actual security interest. So a lot of people think that just um, selling goods to someone is enough. Um, having a credit application is enough. It's actually not enough just to have that. You really need specific clauses within your terms and conditions and within that contract with your customer to give you um, the right to register and create that security interest. So for most people out there, that's going to be their ROT clause or their retention of title clause. So for people who don't actually know what an ROT clause is, it's essentially a clause in your contract or your terms and conditions that allows you to keep ownership of um, the goods or the assets um, that you have until you've actually received payment for those goods. Um, so that's generally what will create the security interest for you in your contract. Um, and once you've got your security agreement and um, some nicely drafted clauses within that to give you the protection, the final step that you actually need and the most important step is the registration step. Um, so if you aren't registered and your customer unfortunately goes into liquidation, then you are, as Gavin said previously, um, you're, you're going to lose, potentially lose ownership over um, over those goods or, or that asset. So it's a it's a different concept to what we are used to thinking of. We're used to sort of thinking of, oh, well, that, that asset's mine. You know, I sold it to you. I haven't received payment and therefore I should get it back. Um, that's not the case anymore unless you've actually got um, a valid registration that's based on your valid contract and um, your security interest. Not sure if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Gavin. Uh, no, I don't think I could add, add anything more, Natalie. So thank you. That's um, very comprehensive. Let's talk about the security agreement itself. Okay, so um, I see um, lots of clients who either don't have any terms and conditions. So if you're one of those um, people out there who is registering but doesn't actually have um, any terms and conditions, then you might want to um, come and see me about that. Um, and as well, I see a lot of clients who come to me and they've got terms and conditions and they might refer to the PPSA, 
um, but they're not actually validly drafted. So um, you do need to really consider the wording in your security agreement or your terms and conditions um, to make sure that you've actually created um, that security interest validly. Um, and there are lots of things that you can add to your sort of basic PPSA clause um, to make sure that you are putting yourself in the best position possible um, once your customer goes into um, liquidation. So giving yourself the right to, um, or an insolvency regime, giving yourself a right to um, claim proceeds over the sale of your goods um, is, is a good one to have in your um, security agreement. Um, you are actually required to give notice to your customer of your registration. So um, having a clause in your terms and conditions that allows you to um, waive any notice periods, um, any notice documents to your customer makes the process um, a lot easier. So um, as well as making sure that you've got that security interest, you wanna also make your life as easy as possible um, once you actually do have to rely on your registration. Um, and the third thing we always recommend is checking um, the other clauses within your, um, within your contract to make sure that you're not invalidating the security agreement that you've created. Um, for example, I know that a lot of my clients will have um, a summary uh, set of terms on the back of their invoice and that'll go out with the invoice. Um, you need to make sure that if you've got PPSA terms or, or any terms really on that, that they are um, matching up to the terms that you've got in your main contract. Um, they're not conflicting with each other and you're not inadvertently um, invalidating your security um, interest. Um, and also looking at some other sort of supplementary documents. So if you've got maybe a quote form, just making sure that all of your documents um, sit together um, and you're not um, invalidating anything by having multiple documents with different terms and conditions. So yeah, just having a streamlined process with that contract or those terms and conditions. And, and would it be fair to say that liquidators will look at those terms and, and the, the security agreements with a, with a fairly fine tooth comb to look for, look for errors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing that they want to do is um, keep your asset for themselves so that they can use it to sell it um, and, and use it for the benefit of creditors. So they're going to be looking at anything that they can to negotiate with you um, to either not give you your goods back not pay you or um, pay you as little as possible. So you really need to make sure that um, you set yourself up right at the start so that when it does come to having to deal with a liquidator, um, you have all of your ducks in a line and um, you're, you're protected. Get expert advice is my advice. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so the registration part of it now, you know, the, the PPSR in, in a sense, and this is, um, you know, sort of no disrespect to those who, you know, who wrote the, the, the act itself, you know, it's, it's a fairly simple complex, uh, it's a fairly simple um, idea in terms you, you want to you have a security over, a, you know, a good, for example. However, as we've seen, the security agreement and now the registration does make it quite technical, so you do want to make sure you're getting it right. So maybe talk us through the, uh, the registration part of it. Yeah, definitely. So I guess um, the registration part is a is a, is separate. So you've got your kind of contractual documents that are going to give you the right to register. Um, you need to take as much care um, with registration as you have with your um, security documents. So registration is key. Um, you can't rely anymore on on having that title or ownership to goods, um, as Gavin was mentioning before. Um, if you don't register, um, or if your registration actually has defects, then you may well lose ownership to your goods um, if your customer does go broke. Uh, there are also some very specific timeframes for registration. Um, so we generally recommend to clients make registration part of the onboarding process with your customer. So make sure that you're, um, when you're filling out your credit application, you're getting your terms and conditions signed, you're gonna do that registration um, immediately once that comes back. Um, and in many cases, that'll be before you even supply your customer with any goods um, so that you are um, not missing any of the very strict timeframes that um, are prescribed in the Act. Um, so once you've actually um, come to doing the registration, you need to make sure that um, you have, I guess, 
put in all of the information correctly um, on, on the registration. So checking things like who are you actually dealing with? Um, you know, is your customer a company? Is it an individual, a partnership, a trust? Um, these are things often that um, will you'll get this information um, at, at the start from your customer when they're filling in the credit application process. So making sure that your credit application document is, is asking the right information so that you can put that information straight into your registration. Um, making sure that you know um, the collateral details, so that's the details of your, your product, your goods, your asset. Um, making sure that you know how long you want that registration to last for. Um, there are differing time periods that you can make a registration for. So if you're planning to have a, a very long um, relationship with your customer, you might want a long registration so that you don't miss any, any um, renewal periods. And also making sure that you know whether or not your security interest um, is a PIMSI, so a purchase money security interest. Generally speaking, I'd say probably a lot of people um, on this call today will have PIMSIs. Um, and that's basically where um, the money that you've lent or um, the credit that you're providing is being used as uh, funding to purchase that personal property. So I'd say most people on the call will be um, needing to register PIMSIs. Um, bearing in mind, if you don't have a PIMSI but you register with a PIMSI, you're going to invalidate that registration. Um, and Conversely, if you have a PIMSI and you don't register as a PIMSI, you're going to lose that super priority. So um, there are a number of things that you need to be um, making sure that you're checking off as you're doing your registration, because those are also going to be things that um, insolvency practitioners will be looking for. So they'll look initially at your security agreement and your documentation, and then they're going to look at the registration itself and whether or not there are any flaws or defects that they can use to invalidate that registration. And I think to, to plug Credit Watch again here and the, and the PPSR product that we have, the solution we have, which is, which is PPSR Logic, in an ideal world, you have obviously the agreement that's been you know, checked over, signed off by you know, Natalie, for example, and then you've got an, an online credit application whereby you know, all of the, the information you need to collect on your customer is collected they're agreeing, signing to terms and conditions. Um, and as part of that process, that automated process, you can actually approve them for credit because you've got the credit report or the credit score or the decision that's come through the online application. And at the same time, create an automatic registration as well. So bang, click, approve this particular customer. And then the next thing that pops up in front of you is, would you like to register this on the PPSR? Yes, and then you've actually got templates, you know, which might have a PIMSI or, or, or not, depending on you know your 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 setup. Um, but the important thing is you just don't you don't miss anything in that process. Um, you're also collecting all the relevant information. It's all being stored securely as well, um, and and you can have a really nice easy process to to onboard a customer, collect the data, get them to sign off on everything, and then ultimately register. Um, the, uh, the registration on, on the PPSR. And just on that point, um, Patrick, I think it's also about keeping track of your renewals um, and any registrations that actually need to be removed as well. So it's yes, a good way to put everything sort of in, a, in, in one spot, I guess, and, and you've got that process that you can follow um, throughout the, the trading relationship with your customer. Yeah, so PPSR Logic will do that. You'll be able to see all of your registrations in, in one place, um, easy to, um, to renew them. You actually get alerts, so you can see those that are coming up and then you get alerts and, and easy to discharge registrations as well. Yep. Hey, if I, just um, if I jump in there, Natalie, you mentioned um, the term super priority there before as it related to PIMSIs mm -hmm. um, and the like. So if somebody is the, amongst those 47% who currently aren't using the PPSR, and they're going, oh, the bank's already giving finance to, to this company. So, you know, what benefit is going to provide to me when I'm just supplying, you know, some inventory to, uh, to this company or other? How, how would that help? So if you're registering as a PIMSI, you're going to actually rank ahead of the bank. So the bank will probably be taking sort of a general um, 
the security interest over, over the general assets of, of your customer, but your um, PIMSI registration is going to rank ahead of that um, by virtue of the fact that you've um, either um, extended credit or, or supplied funds for um, that purchase price of the personal property. So regardless of um, however many other general security agreements are out there, that PIMSI registration is extremely important um, to make sure that you've, you've ticked that box. Um, if you do have a PIMSI. And, and if, for those people who are regular suppliers of goods for inventory, for example, to a particular um, you know, business, do they have to make a registration every time that they make a supply? Um, that's going to depend, Gavin, on your terms and conditions. So the ideal position is that you've got one security agreement and you're going to do one global registration. Um, so kind of like a set and forget process. Um, if you have a look at some terms and conditions that I see come through, um, what they actually say is, you know, each and every supply will create a new contract with you, something along those lines. Um, what that can tend to mean is that you're going to have to make a registration each time you supply. And ideally, you wouldn't have to do that because it's potentially could get quite expensive um, and, and it's probably an administrative nightmare. So the ideal position is making sure that your terms and conditions set you up in a way that you just do one initial global registration and you don't have to think about it again until Unfortunately, your customer um, goes into liquidation or has an, some sort of insolvency practitioner appointed. So um, that's, I guess, um, where it's really important to make sure that it's not just your ROT clause and your PPSA clause that are actually protecting you. It's also those other global terms that you need to make sure really give you the best protection. Thanks very much. That's yeah, good, great, great question. Good practical uh, questions there. And it's not often you get a um, you get to get above the bank. So please do take your money, please, Dan, because they're very stacked and very powerful. <laughs> all right, so we've done all of this. The customer's gone broke. Now what? Customer's gone broke. So the first thing you obviously want to do is either get your goods back or you want to get paid. Um, and the only way that you're going to do that is by being proactive. So um, you really need to get on the front foot. You need to contact the insolvency practitioner as soon as you can so that you notify them of your security interest, notify them of your registration and start that process to find out where are your goods, have they been sold, are there any proceeds that you can um, maybe make a claim over. So what we generally recommend to clients is have some sort of standard letter that you would normally send out once you know that an insolvency practitioner has been appointed. Some of the things that you're going to be asking for is a, a stock take urgently so that you can find out if your goods are still um, on, on premises, for example, if they've been sold. Um, have any sale of your goods be, be stopped immediately. Have your goods be stored separately um, and any proceeds also be um, kept separate as well access to the premises as well. You know, you might need to inspect um, some of the goods that, that are held there. Um, and again, if you've got a clause in your um, terms and conditions that allows you to do that, that's ideal. Um, lots of terms and conditions that I see don't actually have that. Um, and then asking for a debtor's ledger as well. So the idea being that you can um, find out where your goods are and, and, and get paid as quickly as possible if you can. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You, the the insolvency practitioner, sh will will see all of this information, all the registrations, right? So, yeah. when when they take yeah. when they take control of the company, they they should see all that, and that'll be one of the first things that they do. It will be, yeah. One of the first things they'll do, they'll do a search of the register, um, and they'll have a look at um, at what's there. Um, it's probably going to be on you then um, to prove that you've got a valid security interest. Um, so you've yep. got proper proper documentation, a proper registration, um, and therefore that you actually are entitled to um, to have to get those goods back or, or any proceeds. Yeah, yeah. So having the, the monitoring set up with Credit Watch, for example, you'll get the email alert to say XYZ price limit has gone into administration. Um, you'll actually be able to see the administrator's contact details in the insolvency notice. So get on the front foot as quickly as possible. Um, so that you can 
um, hopefully get your goods and your um, funds back. Yeah, I think in, in that situation, um, the insolvency practitioner is not your friend. They, you know, they want to keep as many assets as they can for themselves. So if there's something there that they can take and, um, and sell, they're going to do that. So yeah, you really need to be um, on the front foot with it. So cynical we now. So cynical. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I think yeah, it's, a re it's a really important point that, you know, it's, it's, it's money that's owed you. You should be proactive. You need to be proactive and think about that. Um, yeah, we've also worked with, in fact, the the peak one of the peak bodies for the insolvency profession to develop a a short guide as to how to help people to um, know how to deal with liquidators and um, other insolvency practitioners in the event of insolvency. So I think having the the pro forma letter type of a situation that Natalie was referring to, jump on our site, have a look at this guide, have it there ready, understand it, so that in the event that does happen, you can be proactive. You know using the tools like Patrick mentioned, et cetera, there are, are certainly other other avenues to consider within that, but that productivity is the best chance you've got to maximise what you can get back out of a an unfortunate event like an insolvency. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think the other the other thing that, you know, we found with all the customers who are using us for registrations is the email address that is linked to your um, your registration should most likely be a fairly generic one, um, or it's the you know the MD, because what we've found that's happened in the past is they might you know it might be Patrick Coglin at creditorwatch.com.au, but then I leave, but my email address doesn't get updated, and all of a sudden an email comes through from the insolvency practitioner, and there's and there's no one to actually address it because it's a you know it's just a dead email now. Whereas if it came through to you know PPSR at creditorwatch.com.au. Um, that could go to uh, multiple people so that you're on the front foot as well. Just something to think about. Definitely. All right, Gavin, can you chat us through some of the statistics, some of the things that we're seeing? Yeah, so it's really interesting uh, you know, situation. We saw throughout March, just the month of March, in fact, a record number of searches on the PPSR. So that's a really interesting, and that's across the board. We looked at where those searches are coming from. Um, and it's really quite evenly spread across all users and all user types um, across the registry. So that, I think, you know, what's, you, you think about what's going on in the economy, maybe people were starting to really realise that this is a useful risk management tool coming to the end of sort of the job keeper and stuff like that. Were they thinking that they could be, um, you know, exp under, wanting to understand the exposure of their clients? We're not really sure exactly what the, the driving force as to why, but I guess one of the key points is that it's really being used a lot. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's around, you know, two, two and a half million registrations every year made on the um, the registry. Um, there's progressive growth because there's obviously a range of discharges about um, between one and a half and two million uh, odd di discharges occurring each year, which is also a really good thing. That means that people are keeping the registry clean so that when you guys want to access it to really, you know, get the best data out of it that, um, that you can. Uh, and there is a hell of a lot of amendment activity as well going on. So those changes about email addresses, Patrick, which you said are really important, absolutely agree. We see a lot of activity where people are maintaining those as well. So if that's not a practice that you've already started to deploy, you know, I think you'd know, certainly take that advice uh, from Patrick and Natalie around doing those types of things as well. A lot of people, other people are because they, they see the importance of this. this. Yeah, this is a great stat that sort of, um, you know, I think PPSR registrations, uh, registrations, but also searches are a really good um, heartbeat of the economy. It's you know it's showing trade, it's showing um, people performing searches or registering. You know that trade is happening, you know, at a B2B level, but also at a consumer level as well. So it's great to see it increase. March is often my favourite month of the year from a commercial aspect because you find that you know, November, December, Jan, Feb are either you know. Uh, slow because of Christmas, New Year's, or they're shorter months, or there's, you know, Australians like to slow down around that period. You, you know, you sort of get into March, and it's a, it's the first real good month of uh, of the new year where people, you know, get back to work, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, and that, I mean that search activity. It's, you know, so there's a measure by the World Bank out there actually that shows where a good practice is in an economy here to show that the, this tool, which is a relatively modern uh, phenomenon around the world. Um, the World Bank's helping many countries actually put in 
similar systems. The G20 has also adopted this as a best practice approach around the world. So we're certainly not an outlier in what we've done here, by the way. But the, the measure shows that if you've got between three and six searches for every new registration that you're in good practice land, we're about that four mark. And why, when you think about the transaction, that's really important because before you actually decide as a part of your credit decisioning process, you want to actually do a search to understand the exposure um, of your client. You'll then make another, um, you, you'll, you know, you, you'll do another search just before you actually uh, disperse any of the funds or allow the person to walk out the door with the, with the goods on an ROT type of a, um, uh, an agreement. Um, you then, you know, obviously make your registration probably just before they walked out the door and you do another search just to make sure that that registration has been updated correctly for you um, and like there. That's the sort of the, the general um, practice that we see. Now, that sounds like it could be an expensive exercise. Um, and Natalie referred to it could get out of hand if you had to do, you know, multiple registrations because you didn't um, set the terms and conditions up in your security agreement properly. But in fact, it's not. It's two bucks for a search. So three searches, six bucks. It's six bucks to make a registration for uh, for seven years, which is the the most overwhelmingly common um, duration for the registration. Um, so twelve bucks for a, for a transaction isn't a significant amount when you think about what you might lose um, potentially in the event if, if you don't do it. I'll, um, I'll add a little asterisk there and say obviously credit watch gets charged the same amount for a search and a registration as you uh, as as APSA or PBSR charge direct. So there's a there is a, a little premium on top of that if you're using it through uh, yes, through credit watch. Uh, yes, I perhaps logic. I should have thought about that before I highlighted that, Patrick. But thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'll say that there's an obvious reason for the premium, but also there's a lot of uh, research and development and you know user experience and additional features that go into that as well. Um, but I think just just to your point about searches, um, you know, gone are the days of, of companies, creditors relying on, you know, credit inquiries. They'd run a report, have a look at the credit inquiries to see what other businesses had been inquiring on that particular, you know, potential debtor or applicant. Um, you know, you don't actually know whether they've gone ahead. You know, they might have applied with that company but not actually gone ahead and taken any goods or services from them. Um, PPSR registrations. If you perform a search, you can actually see who the other creditors are. So it's a it's a much it's a much more um, uh, verified way of understanding who who the uh, who the other creditors are and, and, and whether they've gone ahead with something. All right. PPSA tips. Who's going to take this one? I can I can take this one, Patrick. We, we look we've discussed some of these already, um, but it's basically just um, you know some things to make sure that you are protected. So um, reviewing your contracts, making sure that you've got that that security interest and, and that your terms and conditions or contract are actually considered a security agreement. Um, checking the wording of those particular clauses. Um, to make sure that you're registering in the right way in the way in which your terms and conditions allow you to. Um, so for example, one, one global registration as, as opposed to every time you supply. Um, looking at your credit application and reviewing the way in which you're collecting information from your customers and actually having that information verified is really important. Um, chances are if you've got incorrect information in your credit application, your registration is going to be incorrect as well and that's going to invalidate your whole security interest. So um, that's really important. Um, making sure that you register on time, so not missing any of those deadlines, um, having that um, as part of your onboarding process, as I mentioned before, and having a process for um, expiring registrations and, and um, renewal of registrations making sure that you're using um, the resources that are available. So I know that um, AFSA and Gavin's team have a huge amount of resources available on the website. And that in particular, there's some great resources um, under the COVID-19 section on the website. So really um, taking the time to go and have a look, read through those, um, checking credit to watch. And we've obviously got some resources too that you can use to your advantage. Um, and of course, goes without saying, um, seeking advice early. So um, making sure that you're getting um, expert assistance if you need it, um, not making assumptions and um, yeah, just getting help with, with that whole process, whether it's your terms and conditions, your credit application, um, the actual registration process, or when it comes to dealing with the insolvency practitioner. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm just conscious of time here. I've just had a little look and, and got a little bit, 
um, carried away with the discussion today. So I will I will try to move us along quite quickly. Um, uh, this is this is PPSA uh, lead check, obviously a Leadland lawyer um, product. Natalie, I'll obviously let you talk to this. Give the uh, give us the the elevator pitch. <laughs> sure. Look, um, I know everybody is probably now after this webinar thinking, gosh. What, what does my PPSA clause look like? How good is it? Where does it rank? Um, you know, across the board. So um, we do have a, a page on our website. Um, so the, the address is there where you can upload your, your terms and conditions. We'll have a look at your PPSA clause for you and those corresponding clauses. We'll give you a score out of 10. Um, we'll list some of the risks that we see associated with that clause and we'll give you some tips to improve it. Um, and that's a free, um, process so you don't have to be concerned about how much that's going to cost um, and that'll I guess just give a lot of um, people out there listening to the webinar maybe some comfort or maybe um, you know some inspiration to to review their processes and um, make sure that they are protected and that their registration process is the way that it should be. Fantastic thank you and we'll obviously be sharing these slides so you'll be able to access that if you haven't already written down. I'm not even going to talk about PPSR logic um, for more than 10 seconds, but obviously it's our platform. It integrates directly with Creditor Watch and also with ApplyEasy, which is our online credit application. So it's all things PPSR registrations, um, management of them, discharge, um, searches, etc. So if you've got, if you're doing sort of more than I would say, you know, three a month, I would be suggesting that you uh, you chat to us about PPSR logic and, and how that can help you and just make sure it takes out any of the really human errors that can jump jump out at you or the pitfalls that, that are there. Um, I'm very, very conscious of time, so I'm, I'm actually not going to address any questions. We do have a huge amount that have come through, but I also know that people need to go for lunch or get back to work. Generally, we're, fine, we're, we're getting right up to that, that hour mark, which is really the maximum. Um, however, what I will do is I will um, get the team here at Credit Watch to have a look through some of those questions um, and we will get back to you. So I promise you we will get back to you. If you don't hear from us or from Natalie or from AFSA, for example, um, you know, please, you can email me a, um, a somewhat abusive email and say, Patrick, you promised and you didn't get back to me and I will chase it up for you personally get back to you, okay? Um, a whole bunch of information, of course. Um, AFSA's got a, a PPSR guide. Jump on their, on their website, jump on PPSR. It is really, really user-friendly. They've done a fantastic job of making it easy to understand um, and also get the, 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 the education that you need to get your head around it. Of course, you've then got Predator Watch. We've got a whole bunch of PPSR um, uh, bits of content to assist you as well. And then we've got um, the wonderful Natalie Ledlin and Ledlin lawyers too, who can um, who can help out with the, the trickier questions. And don't forget, um, that's just education hub, of course. Some contact details here for both um, AFSA, PPSR and Ledlin lawyers. Take screen grab, write it down quickly, take a photo with your phone if you wanna get in touch or of course, I'll come back and grab a quick poll, which is an even better way to work it out. Would you like to speak to someone about the PPSR? If you say yes, we will facilitate who that someone is, whether it's someone at Credit or Watch. Of course, we've got PPSR Paul, our in-house PPSR expert, um, or it might be uh, uh, Natalie and Leatherland lawyers, or potentially someone from APSA. So let me know, yes or no, don't be shy to say no, I won't take any offence to it at all. Give another five seconds for you to get your votes in. We're only at about 40%. Two options there for you, yes or no. And then we will wrap it up. I'll say thank you. Actually, while we're doing that, I will say thank you now to um, Natalie and Gavin. Thank you so much for joining us today. A lot of work goes into this behind the scenes, in particular content being put together, um, taking the time to make sure that we're all talking about, you know, the same thing and somewhat on the same page. Um, so I think we've done a great job here. Was there anything that either of you wanted to add as a, as a sort of final thought before we, um, before we wrap it up? Natalie, I'll let you go first. 
Um, nothing specific, Patrick, just yet. Yeah, always happy to chat to people about um, PPSA. I've got absolutely no life, so I'm here ready to, to take calls and, and, and have a chat. <laughs> So if you do have any questions, feel free um, to reach out. Um, either myself or one of the team will be more than happy to talk to anyone about, about any issues or questions that they've got. Great, thank you, Natalie. And Gavin, a final word for everyone? No, just thank you. Thanks, Patrick, for hosting the event and Natalie for um, co-presenting. Um, yeah, just glad to get the message out through forums like this, so thank you. Yeah, education is so important. We hear that all the time. People just want to sort of bury their head in the sand and, and events like this and the content that's been produced um, and you guys you know, putting your hands up to say, yep, let us help is, is so important, particularly for, you know, smaller and, and, and medium sized businesses where they don't have a dedicated, you know, credit expert in house. Um, so thank you for that. And, and this won't be the last PPSR session we do. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a part two coming very soon. So we, we will um, have more news about that in time. Otherwise, that is it for today. Thank you so much for staying with us. I know it was a little bit longer, probably another 15, 20 minutes longer than we usually do, but it is a really important topic. It's really important we get through everything. So thank you again to everyone who joined us. We will get back to you with those with the answers to your questions. Um, the recording will be sent out, the slides will be sent out. It's been a fantastic session. Gavin, Natalie, thank you very much. We will see you later and um, we'll be switching on. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.